So, Professor Elroth, very welcome to Fritanke's pod. Thank you. You're a professor of economics at Stanford, and uh, uh, we will discuss your, your field, of course. But this uh, time, I actually have two guests. I also have Tommy Andersson, professor of economics in Lund University, right? Uh, but we will obviously speak English here, uh, even though Tommy is Swedish, uh, to make it a little bit more convenient for you, Al. <laughs> uh, please first tell me what, what made you interested in game theory from start? I mean, if we really go back to your childhood, what created your interest in, in this field? So I don't think I can claim to have had an interest in game theory from childhood. But <laughs> okay. when I went to graduate school, I studied operations research, which is uh, a kind of a, a collection of tools of applied mathematics. Actually, I already studied that as an undergraduate at Columbia University. And then I went to Stanford to get my PhD in operations research. Um, but, and, and game theory seemed to me the most interesting part of operations research as it was then uh, formulated. There, there was lots of optimization, you know, how to do something as well as possible if you knew what that something was. But game theory is about how people with multiple goals interact with each other in the world. And, and that fascinated me. What, who inspired you at this time? I mean, did you have any sort of intellectual role models? Well, I had a number of models, but my dissertation advisor was Bob Wilson, who just recently won the Nobel Prize. And he was That's one right. of the early apostles of game theory. Uh, he understood long before most people that game theory was going to transform economics. Um, but before game theory came to center stage in economics, economists mostly thought about people as, as price takers, as, as uh, sort of passive in the face of the economy and, and doing some individual optimization, making the best choices they could in the face of, of what was ahead of them. But game theorists started to, to think of people as active participants in the economy who could change the economic environment as they interacted with it. And Bob, Bob Wilson understood very early that that was going to transform economics. I see. Tommy, I know that you uh, actually had some contact with John Nash. Well, about contact is maybe to over exaggerate, but I met John Nash, yes. <laughs> but we didn't work or anything like that. I, I've met him. Yeah, but because uh, did, did, you, did you meet uh, John Nash? So I met John Nash um, only after he got the Nobel Prize. He had mm. been quite ill. So, so when I started to study game theory, he was absent. Uh, and, and I think I was aware that he was still alive, but that was not widely appreciated. You know, he, he wasn't working in, in the field. And, and indeed, he was, he was very ill. He wasn't working, I think. Um, but but he, he got started to recover as he, as he became older and eventually won the Nobel Prize and was able to receive it. Uh, and I was certainly aware of his work, but you couldn't study game theory without being aware of John Nash. But I, I I didn't meet him until uh, until after he had won the Nobel Prize. I, I'm mentioning him because he's probably to 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 people outside your field the most well known game theory mathematician in the world because of the movie The Beautiful Minds, right? Yes. Do you think I, I it portraits like the movie? Incidentally, I, I didn't. Sorry. Like the movie, um, because in the movie, it it appeared that he was already ill at the time he did his great work. So, so the theory of the movie was that genius and madness were, were the same thing. And in fact, yeah. when he became ill, he couldn't work anymore. So, so illness is not good for you. <laughs> good so, point. But, but uh, speaking about game theory, so there are uh, two different types of game theory. So you have the, the cooperative game theory and the non-cooperative game theory. And uh, uh, what at least I find very fascinating about your research is that somehow you, you mixed these two types of concepts in game theory. So uh, we will not go into details, but a very important uh, concept in, uh, is stability, which is also the motivation, one of the motivations behind your Nobel Prize. Uh, so, so maybe you can tell for the, for the listeners, what is the distinction between cooperative 
and non-cooperative game theory. And maybe we later on can come back to how you kind of merge them together in, in the beginning of the 1980s. Okay, well, that, that's a great question because I think the distinction is something of a false distinction. But, but it's certainly the way I was taught game theory was that there were two kinds of games and, and theories for each of them. There were games where, where people had to make all their actions independently and those were non-cooperative games. And there were games where people could cooperatively decide what to do and those were cooperative games. But as Tommy points out, when in the kind of work that he and I both do now in market design, uh, we really think about these models as just modeling different aspects of the same game. So, um, so what, what we used to call non-cooperative game theory, I would like to call strategic game theory. It, it's games modeled in terms of the actions and, and strategies that players can choose. And cooperative game theory is models the game in terms of the outcomes that players might be able to achieve. And both of those points of view at different levels of detail are very important when thinking about markets and, and how to design them. Is that uh, okay? Um, tell me. I mean, I'm I'm not I, I I'm not into game theory. I don't know much about it. Can you can you explain what you mean by stability as a concept here? So stability is is a concept that once would have been called part of cooperative game theory, but mm -hmm. um, but what we mean is we're, we're interested in things like like matching, like matching uh, doctors to their jobs or uh, patients to kidneys or refugees to housing. You know, some of these are things that Tommy has studied in, in Sweden. And by stability, what we mean is you get an outcome that has the property that, that people don't work hard to change it after you've suggested it. Uh, so when we talk about matching people to jobs, the idea of stability is that there shouldn't be a person and a job not matched to each other who would both prefer to be matched to each other than who they were matched to. So if, if you're in the business of suggesting which people should take which jobs, then you would like to suggest the stable matching because otherwise, if it's not stable, there will be some person and some, some, some worker and some employer who aren't matched to each other and they'll look at each other and say, what a, what a bad job the market designer did. We should be matched to each other. And often they'll be able to, to be matched to each other, the, especially if the market designer doesn't have any particular authority. So if you want to make suggestions that, that will be followed, you have to uh, give people the incentives to follow them and not give them the incentives to, uh, to change. Uh, and that's what stability is. Okay, but, it, but as, if I understand you correctly, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get matched to the absolutely first-hand choice that you would make, right? Absolutely not. So for instance, I might be matched to my third choice job. And yeah. that means I would prefer to be matched to my second choice or my first choice. The outcome is only unstable if one of those two jobs that I prefer also prefers me. But if the reason I'm in my third choice job is that my first cho choice hired someone they like better and my second choice hired someone they like better, then even though I would have preferred okay. to have one of those other jobs, it's not unstable. I can't call them up and say, how about me? Okay, then I understand. Is this related to Nash equilibrium concept? Well, it's related in a distant way. This is this is why uh, the two kinds of game theory, non-cooperative and cooperative, uh, actually intersect more than we appreciated when I was young. Uh, the way it's related to Nash equilibrium is, in, in order to, to give it a relation to Nash equilibrium, I have to describe how we would go about changing the matching. And I suggested that already when I said I might be able to call you up and say, how about if I come work for you? So in the, in the model of a game in which Nash equilibrium makes sense, we'll have phone calls. I can call you, you can say yes or no. And in that game, it wouldn't be a Nash equilibrium for us to stay at an unstable outcome. But when we're, when we're modeling the game as what used to be called a cooperative game, then we're just modeling the outcomes. And we're noticing that we have this incentive to disrupt the game. In, and, and, but to call it a Nash equilibrium, we'd have to put more structure on, on what particular actions we took, what particular actions I would take so that I could work for you and that you would take so you could employ me. And uh, I think this is, uh, this is a great uh, type of introduction to, to what you describe in, in, your, in your book. 
Uh, it's uh, who gets what and why in English. In Swedish, it's uh, vem for vad och varför, mm. which is a great book. And, and in this book, you, you describe different types of matching markets. And, and there you have this, this idea that on normal markets where you pay a price, then everyone can essentially buy whatever they want as long as they're willing to pay that price. But in matching markets, you also have to be, in a sense, chosen by the by, by the by the good, the kidney or the school seat or something like that. So, so, so maybe you, this brings us in natural to, to, to a matching market. And, and maybe you can describe in more detail what is a matching market and what type of applications do you have in different types of okay. matching markets. So, so I think you said it very well. In, in commodity markets where, where you're just buying goods, you can have whatever you want if you can afford it. But in matching markets where you care who you're dealing with, you can't just choose what you want, you also have to be chosen. So labor markets are a good example. You can't just decide to, to work at, at some firm, you have to be hired. Uh, you can't, school choice is another good example. You, you can't just go to Lund University to study, you have to be accepted and admitted. Um, marriage is a good example. You can't just choose your spouse, you also have to be chosen. Uh, In some countries you can, unfortunately. Well, not not both spouses. Uh, no, that's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, so, uh, so many of the markets we deal with are matching markets in the sense that you you don't just care what you get, but but who you get it from and who you who you get mm. it with. Uh, and and those markets, I think, have been overlooked a bit by economists that that we often tended to model markets as if they were all commodity markets, when of course, some of the most important markets that we go through, you know, schools and, and jobs and medical care are, are matching markets. This is, I guess, also relevant for markets where you, are, because of ethical reasons, you don't want it to be an issue of price. I mean, certain markets, you, you don't want the situation to be that if you are rich enough, you can buy whatever you want, right? That's right. So, so we don't allow people to buy places in public schools. We don't allow them to buy kidneys. Um, and, and as a result, you need another way of, of assigning children to schools and matching people to kidneys. And, and that creates matching markets as well. And you tell me, I mean, th this this book now that just came out in Swedish, Vem for vad och varför, what was your the fundamental reason for you to write it? What did you want to achieve with writing a book instead of just, you know, doing your research? I wanted to do two things. I, I wanted to bring the ideas in the book to a wider audience. And, and there are really two big ideas, I think, that that I'm trying to bring to a wider audience. And one is this idea of matching markets. That, that not all markets are commodity markets. But the other idea is, is market design. It's that markets are human artifacts. We build markets, they're tools that, that people create in order to serve their needs and we can change them. You know, the design of a market is, consists of its rules and, and its uh, infrastructure and, and a number of other things and if markets aren't working the way we want them, we, we can change them. You know, we, we used to speak of the weather as something unchangeable. You just you just experience the weather. And I think there was a time where, where we felt that way a little bit about markets. You know, markets do things and, and we we experience them. But of course, markets are human artifacts. We they're they're human constructions and, and we can change what they do if they're not doing what we think they should be doing. Okay. Uh, and this is also one thing which I think is very fascinating in your book is that, you know, many people think about free markets, you can buy markets, uh, uh, stocks at stock markets, and this is the free market. But these markets, as you said, there are human artifacts, and they are very constructed, and they are guided by very detailed rules about when you can when you can buy and sell stocks and exactly how you place bids and who, who gets gets the bid. So so and uh, um, one of the things that you try to tell in your book is that all markets have a story to tell. And very often, the, you know, it's the details in the markets that that's our, makes the story interesting. So, yeah, so can, can you give us one example of a market that you think is interesting that has a story to tell? And what were the details that made, made this interesting? Well, so one market that I talk about in the book and that, that I have worked uh, to help build and that you 
Tommy have also worked to help build is, is the market for kidney exchange. Uh, you know, it turns out kidney disease, kidney failure is one of the big causes of death all around the world, one of the top 10. And uh, the treatment of choice is transplantation. And you can get a, a kidney for transplantation from a, a dead person if they've died in a suitable way. And there aren't enough of those, those organs for the people who need them. But kidneys are special because healthy people have two kidneys and can remain healthy with one. And so if there's someone you love who's, who's dying of kidney disease, you might be able to give them a kidney. And in the United States, and I think in Sweden also, there's a substantial number of living donor kidney transplants. But sometimes you love someone enough to give them a kidney and you are healthy enough to give someone a kidney, but you can't give it to the person you love. And what, what we've started to work on around the world, in Sweden as well, is, is the idea that maybe, maybe you love someone enough to give them a kidney but can't give them a kidney, and maybe I'm in the same situation, but maybe your kidney would work for my patient and my kidney would work for your patient. And then we mm -hmm. could exchange kidneys and, and save two lives that, that, uh, that might otherwise be lost or that at the very least would, would, the patients would have to wait for a deceased donor kidney, which is a, a long and dangerous wait. So uh, in the US, uh, some years ago now, uh, 10 or 11 years ago now, we, we began to explore kidney exchange. And my understanding is that in recent years, you're, you're doing the same in, uh, in Sweden through Scandia transplant, which will, will have a, uh, an exchange throughout the Nordic countries. And that Tommy yes. has played a big role in that. Yeah, but uh, th that's because I, I stole much of your research. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let, let us just mention that, Tommy, that you actually wrote a book as well about this called Algorithm Markaren in Swedish. Uh, you haven't read it, obviously, because it's in Swedish, Al, but you, 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 you know the stuff. You don't have to read it. <laughs> but uh, Tommy, because you have implemented this in Sweden as well, how has the reaction, the political reactions in Sweden been? So I, I, I guess um, maybe we should take it from the very beginning, because I mean, as I, you know, Al and his colleagues did this in the US, uh, long before I even knew that these programs existed. Mm. So I think it would be more interesting before I answer that question to hear about, you know, what type of ethical conflicts did you have to face in the US? Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, what were the doctors, did they like this idea from the beginning? I, I know that you describe much of this in the book, but, but, but for the listener, it can be interesting to hear, you know, what were the problems to implement this new type of market for kidneys? Well, so, so a first problem was that, um, doctors didn't automatically think of economists as people who would help them in, uh, in, in dealing with kidney disease. So, so it took a lot of time for my colleagues and I to, to learn how to talk to our surgical colleagues so that we could communicate with them effectively. Um, and, um, and, and we met just a very few surgeons initially who were willing to talk to us. Uh, Frank Delmonico and Mike Reese are the names that, that stand out there. And they helped us help their surgical colleagues to organize kidney exchange on a larger scale than had been possible before. I think the very first kidney exchange in the US may have actually been organized by the patients and donors themselves, you know, that they, uh, they met in a dialysis center and, and had a conversation about why they were there. And the reason was, one spouse had blood type A, but her, her husband had blood type B, and the other spouse had the reverse situation. So of course, that's not the way to organize a market that can operate on a large scale. And, and so what we economists brought to the game was, um, was, was to ability to think about that, how, how to make this something at national scale. But it took a long time before, before we could scale up. It, it, it had very, very slow initial progress. Uh, Why was that? Well, partly it's because you need to get a lot of coordination among a lot of different people, among patients and donors and transplant centers. So at the very beginning, we did uh, an exchange, like I described to you, between two pairs. We did it simultaneously so that, um, so that no, we'd never have a couple that gave a kidney but didn't get one. Um, but to do even a simple exchange simultaneously means you need four operating rooms and four surgical teams available at the same time because there are two nephrectomies mm. 
taking the kidney out and to transplants, putting the kidney in. So, um, so for instance, in New England, uh, where I lived at the time, I taught at Harvard University, we had 14 transplant centers and they used to do their kidney exchanges, not, not kidney exchanges, they used to do their kidney transplants on different days of the week. But if you want to do kidney exchange, you have to get them all doing it on the same day of the week. It took a year to do that um, because wow. every thought it was a good idea to do it on the same day of the week and you could do your surgeries on the day that we do ours. Uh, but of course, to, to coordinate even 14 hospitals took a while. Um, so, so there were lots of procedures. We had to get consent from all the donors that we could look at their medical data. Medical data, who can take whose kidney is, is protected by law in the United States. And people who had signed up to give someone a kidney, they, they had agreed that the data could be shared for that purpose. But now we were proposing to look at the same data for a different purpose. And, and we had to get permission to do that. So, so there were lots of logistical things that had to be accomplished. Uh, and then over the years, uh, we've learned how to do much larger exchanges. And that took experimentation and, and more coordination. Uh, when we started in the United States, donors would travel to, to where the patient was. And now we ship kidneys. It turns out you can ship kidneys. Uh, and so that uh, makes things easier. But there are financial obstacles in the United States we don't have a single payer health system. So different hospitals have different costs for nephrectomies and transplants. And we had to find a way to, to do the accounting. So, so all of those things took time. But today we do uh, well over a thousand transplants a year through kidney exchange. So we do about six or 7,000 living donor transplants and, and about a thousand to 1500 are, are through exchange. When I say today, I actually don't have the figures for the last year, which had COVID. Uh, and, and so I think we, you know, I'm talking about 2019. Uh, I think we have, we may have somewhat fewer transplants in this last year when, when uh, yeah. COVID took, took so much of our attention. But I, I must ask you, maybe this is a kind of meta question, but what, what is it that made you want to make a difference on this very practical level instead of just staying in your theoretical research, so to speak? Well, so game theory as theory, as theoretical research, brings you a little bit close to markets because you're thinking about rules and how people engage in the market. And, um, and at some point, uh, I, I began to look at particular markets because they were interesting. And the first one I looked at was the job market for American doctors, how American doctors get their first jobs. And that was a market that as an economist, I, I studied and with, with no intention of doing market design. And it had some interesting problems. And, and one of the problems had to do with the fact with the changing demographics of American doctors. So uh, in the 1950s, uh, almost 100% of American doctors were men. Today, half of American doctors are women, uh, maybe slightly more. Um, and one of the ways that changed the labor market for doctors is doctors in medical school would sometimes marry each other. And then when it came time for them to look for their first jobs, they needed two jobs. So mm. that was a, a problem that, that was a very specific problem. You could, you could think about it theoretically. Uh, and, and I wrote a paper in the 1980s saying, uh, this is a hard problem because the stability properties that we already talked about that are, that are possible in a, in a labor market where everyone is looking for one job may not always be available uh, when, when there are two career households, when there are people looking for two jobs. And because when I wrote that paper, I was just thinking as a theorist, I stopped there. I said, this is a hard problem, full stop. And, and it was a great paper, you know, you, I, I pointed out that some problem was hard. So then years later, I was sitting in my office at the University of Pittsburgh when the phone rang and there was a crisis in the market for, for doctors. And on the, on the other end of the phone was a man named Bob Barron, who was the director of the clearinghouse that, that matched doctors into their jobs. And he asked me if he, he explained that there was a crisis. I had been following it, so I was aware of that. Uh, and he asked whether I would redesign the match to, to address these problems. And uh, I still very much remember 
being on the phone with him and thinking, oh, I'm, I'm sorry I picked up the phone because if I say <laughs> yes, which of course I'll have to say yes, then, then this hard problem, which I've studied, will become my problem. It'll still be a hard problem, but, but it won't be enough for me to say, look, there's a hard problem. Uh, and so that's really how I began to be a market designer. I agreed to try to redesign the medical match in the United States. And you managed to do it. I did uh, with, with, with others. I worked with a man named Elliot Parenton. Uh, it must and, be a great satisfaction to be able to really affect real lives uh, for people in that way. You know, years ago when I met Tommy, that's what he said to me. He said, you know, you mm. must sleep easy at night. And I think, what I, said <laughs> to him, I think what I said to him is, you know, there are moments of satisfaction, but market design is mostly about long periods of frustration when, uh, <laughs> when you have this hard yes. problem you can't solve or when you mm. think you've solved it, but now you have to convince people to... to uh, adopt it and implement it. Uh, so, um, so there's some satisfaction, absolutely. But just incidentally, the American market for doctors now, uh, 25 years later, is having some new problems, and I'm involved in in trying to think about how to resolve them. And um, and I'm still at the stage of frustration. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe we will. Uh, help them again this time, but, but it's not so easy. And, and of course, lots of people are involved and there are many different opinions and many different proposals. And, um, and I think the you know, two generations of doctors have, have come and gone. So the, the current uh, medical community is no longer as aware as they once were of, of, the, of the problems we once had and how we solved them. So some of the solutions to the new current problems would, would uh, undermine the, would bring back the old problems. So, so markets are living things. Uh, you know, you're never yeah. quite done with them. But, but tell me, uh, when you get, got into the kidney exchange problem, what kind of um, ethical object objections were, were raised against your, your method and your model? Well, so, so there were some. Um, for example, kidney exchange is still today illegal or, or not legal in Germany, where, uh, where the law says that you can only receive a, a living donor kidney from a member of your immediate family, right? So what they are worried about is that somehow uh, living donors will be exploited, right? Uh, and and maybe, uh, maybe a black market involving payments will, will occur, which, which they think would be a very bad thing, and which is repugnant all over the world with, with the notable exception of the Islamic Republic of Iran, where there's a monetary yeah. market for, for living donor kidneys. Um, yeah. so, so there were concerns like that. But a lot of it is, you know, transplantation is a very funny part of medicine because you're, you're getting an organ from one person and, and giving it to another person. And when the donor is dead, there are not so many ethical considerations that bother people. But when the donor is alive, you have to be sure that you're taking excellent care of the donor and that the donor is very willing and not coerced in any way uh, and, and really wants to do this. So, so with any living donor procedure in the United States, not just kidney exchange, not just exchange, um, there, there's a long process in which the donor has to sort of qualify and prove that he or she really wants to do this and is healthy enough to do it. Um, so. So I think a lot of the concerns were about that. Um, mm. but, and then there are concerns that aren't, don't rise to the level of being ethical, but are practical, like how to arrange all the payments so that, um, that all the transplant centers and all the doctors and all the patients and donors are well taken care of in a, in a seamless way. And because we have such a fragmented medical system in the United States, that's taken more work than it might take in Sweden. But incidentally, there's still issues about exchange across international borders uh, because there are all these questions about how to handle the finances and how to handle the post-operative care work. So, so we've been in discussions about how to expand kidney exchange uh, so that people who have a lot of trouble finding a kidney can, can be exposed to the, to the worldwide pool instead of just the pool where they live, uh, which is what uh, Scandia transplant is trying to do within the Nordic countries. You know, not Swedish people shouldn't only be able to get kidneys from other Swedish people, but also 
from Danish people. But, but when you start thinking of that, you realize that it's a worldwide problem. And so sometimes we get ethical concerns about that as well. Uh, how do you think about exchanges that, that go between rich countries and poor countries, for instance? And in poor countries, uh, kidney disease is a death sentence. So the, the need to, to bring um, medical care to, to people in poor countries is, is very large. So I think it's very fascinating to, to hear you to tell all this story, which, which some of them which you tell in great, great detail in your book, because I mean, everything you just said is also true for Sweden. You know, the same type of concerns that they had in the US, they also had here in Sweden. And then once we decided to do it, you know, we had to manage all the logistics and, and all these things. Uh, but uh, one thing which I think is a bit different between Sweden and the US, there are many things, but, but one big thing is that we started doing kidney exchange here in Sweden. But when Denmark joined our program, we closed the national Swedish program. So we had the joint kidney exchange program between Sweden and Denmark. And now uh, Norway is also part of the program and Finland actually joined. And Finland was one of these countries which is uh, very uh, similar to Germany. So it was almost forbidden to donate to someone outside of your family. Uh, and the reason why we, why we needed to do this here in, in Scandinavia was that our markets was not thick enough. I mean, there were small countries. And, and one very important concept in, in your book is related to the thickness of the market. It's important that the market is thick enough to, to, to work. Can you elaborate a bit about the concept of thickness and why it's important to have thick markets? And what does it mean? Okay, well, basically a market is thick when enough people are coming to the market so that, that if you go to the market, you might be able to find a transaction there, right? So, um, you know, if very few people are interested in exchanging kidneys, then it may be hard to find a kidney that will work for, for you and your patient. Uh, but if there are a really large number, then, then you might be able to find an exchange because not everyone can take every kidney. Uh, in the same way, think of, um, think of a, a big internet seller like Amazon. You can buy lots of things on Amazon. Uh, that's part of its attraction. You, that, that's why people go there. It's because you don't have to look at lots of different websites to, to find what you want to buy. Um, similarly, again, again, you know, I'm not quite sure the market penetration in Sweden of these companies, but, but think of Airbnb. Uh, you know, if you want to find a room, a uh, 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 place to stay so around the world, you can go to Airbnb and, and there will be people who are willing to rent and people who are looking to, to stay. And, and that makes Airbnb attractive. If you had to go to a, a different site in each country, the market would be thinner. And if you had to go to a different site in each city, the markets would be thinner still. So a thick market is one that, that has lots of potential transactions in it that you might be able to find when you're looking for a transaction. And of course, for kidneys, the issue is that some people are highly sensitized. It means that they can hardly take any kidneys. Uh, so, so they need a big set of people to, to try to find an exchange with because it's hard. For and this is, this is because of the blood, blood type, you mean? It's a little bit because of the blood type, but there are only four blood types. It's more because of, of antibodies that people have to, to human proteins called human leukocyte antigens, which uh -huh. uh, if, if someone has been sick for a long time, they may have been exposed through blood transfusions or through a previous kidney transplant to lots of, of human antibodies. And, they, and your immune system is set up to protect you from foreign objects. And, uh -huh. and so you might have antibodies to my kidney that would would prevent you from taking my kidney. And this is true, uh, you don't have to have been very sick. Uh, you know, if, if I didn't know my blood type, then I would say that, that on average, the chance that you could take my kidney is around 50%. But the chance that my wife could take my kidney or that your wife could take your kidney is, is only about 30%. And that's because one of the ways you get antibodies to human proteins is by giving birth to a child. Uh -huh child has different proteins than the mother that you, know, you get half your proteins from your dad. So in the course of childbirth, women can become exposed to, to the paternal proteins, the, the dad's proteins that are in the children, and her immune system might develop antibodies. And this doesn't stop her from having another child because the child is in the placenta, is, 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 is separate from her immune system. But if the dad's kidneys were to show up, her immune system would be prepared to attack it. 
And so, so even between husbands and wives, if they're parents, it's often that the, the wife can't take the husband's kidney. Uh, and, but, but if you've had multiple children, especially if you've had multiple children with multiple fathers, then, then you might have lots of antibodies. Um, and, and many of our most difficult to match patients have so many antibodies that, it, that it's, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. You, you have to search very widely, and that's why you need a thick market to find a compatible kidney. I see. Uh, and this is also interesting because there are some new medical developments here. So, for example, here in, in Scandinavia, when we do the kidney exchange, we typically transplant across the blood group barrier because there are different ways to, to remove that blood type incompatibility. And then it's essentially only the tissue type that, that matters. Mm -hmm. So there are more, you know, in, we learn many interesting facts about medicine that we never thought we would have to learn. But this is, again, one of all these details you as a market designer need to learn to understand how to design uh, the, the, the design a market. It sounds like you ha had to learn a lot of medical things <laughs> to, to do well, this, obviously. I, I, I've learned some medical things. Uh, and, uh, and the medicine has changed. As Tommy says, you know, we, we can do more kinds of transplants than we used to, and we can uh, more accurately diagnose which kidneys are compatible and which are not than we used to. The, the immunology has changed in the last 20 years so that, uh, that we understand much better about what, what causes difficulties. And also about what, you know, we talked earlier about, about matching markets. It turns out that if you get a living donor kidney, there's there's a good chance that in 20 years from now, you might need another. They, they don't last forever, uh, although some last a very long time. Uh, but we can start to anticipate how highly sensitized you will be at that time. That is, your, your body, in, after 20 years, if it rejects a kidney, you will have a lot more antibodies, and it'll be harder for you to get a new kidney. But which kidney you get now influences that process. So we're, we're starting to be able to understand how to look ahead and, and make life easier the next time someone needs a kidney. Uh, Tommy, tell us a little bit about the reactions in Sweden now. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, the reactions in Sweden has been, has been good, but that's mainly because I think uh, uh, in Sweden uh, we had good press, I think. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, uh, let, let me just tell you a story which relates to Al. So, uh, of course, I, I've done different types of mechanism and market design, what we call it, for many, many years. But I actually never thought about the kidney exchange program uh, until Al got his Nobel Prize in in uh, in in 2012. He shared it with Lloyd Shapley, and yeah. And then I was asked by this medical journal because they had read that that there were some applica medical applications to this, and if I could write something for this medical journal. And of course, I knew about kidney exchange, but I had never done any research on it myself. So. Thanks to Al, I had to write this article, which was found by, by some doctors in Stockholm and Gothenburg. And then we started to talk. But then it took many, many years before everything was implemented. And now I think that, at least here, I mean, we see now that 10 and soon 15% of all living transplants will be due to this program. And everybody seems happy and everything has went well so far. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, it's always a bit nervous in the end. What if the first kidney exchange would fail for some reason? By yeah. By luck, uh, by, by a chance. So, so I mean, he, here in Sweden, I think this is uh, the work that Al and his colleague pioneered uh, 15 years ago in the U.S. has been uh, tremendously important, and it was saved taxpayers' money. It has saved lives, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so it has been very important. Do you have any mechanism in the method to deal with um, failures? For example, the, one of the kidneys in the transportation is crashing, the car is crashing, and so one of the kidneys are, are destroyed, for example. How do you deal with that? Well, we, we worry about that a lot, and there have been very, very few cases that, that seem like that. But, uh, but one of the things that we try to do in case someone who is just about to get a kidney doesn't get one is we can sometimes um, we can sometimes prioritize them in the deceased donor market, for example, uh, so that they can they can get a replacement kidney uh, faster mm -hmm. than they would have if there hadn't been an emergency. Uh, and sometimes also, uh, 
another living donor steps forward. So there, there have been uh, times when, when in emergencies like that, uh, either a deceased donor or a living donor is found. But, um, but transplantation, with, even when it doesn't involve exchange, always involves some risk, right? You, you, most, most kidney transplants in the US work. We have well over 90% one year graft survival for kidney transplants. So, so well over 90%. Uh, I think it's up to like 95 or 97 percent for living uh, kidneys uh, are successful, but some are not. Sometimes the kidney doesn't start to work; it doesn't make urine, or the body rejects it, or or there's some damage to the kidney that hadn't been understood, uh, and so sometimes the patient has to go back on dialysis. But that's very, very rare. So, so, so let me change subject a little bit. Sure. So, so in in your book, you also you have, you describe so many interesting problems in your book, and and the, one of the things that you describe in your book is is how uh, how important it is for to have the the right incentives at markets because I mean people tend to misrepresent preferences and they tend to lie when they can. Can you maybe give us uh, an introduction to to the wonderful world of? of incentive problems, maybe discussing your work on school choice in, in Boston, for example. Okay, that's a, that's a good example. Um, so in Boston and in New York and in a number of American cities, uh, families get to have some input into what schools their children go to. And the way we ask for that input is we normally say, please give us a list of schools that you would like your child to go to. What's your first choice and your second choice and your third choice? And it's of course terribly important what we do with those lists. And in Boston, there was, and in other American cities, they, they, they were trying to be very helpful to families. They, the goal of the school board was to, to put children where their families wanted them to go. And to do this, what they did is they, they first looked at how many first choices they could make, how many first choice assignments they could make. So they looked at, all the people who had submitted rank order lists and they looked at their first choice and they said, can we put that child in that school, the school that's a first choice? And of course, some schools have more demand for them as first choices than they have capacity. And so they can't put all the students in a, in a particular school who have uh, chosen it as their first choice. They can only put some of them up to the capacity of the school. And so they had a, developed a, a set of priorities. They said, Maybe a child who has a sibling already going to the school, a brother or a sister, they have the first priority. Maybe a child who lives near the school has the second priority. And, and if we get through all the priorities, then maybe we'll use a random number. We'll assign a random number to every child, and the child with the lower number will, will get priority. And this is to break ties, how to assign the last available place in that school. Uh, and then they, they said, so, so they were trying to give as many people as possible their first choice using that method. And then there would still be people unassigned, people who couldn't get into their first choice because there were too many children who wanted that place. And they would say, let's try to give them their second choice using the priorities again. And then of those left over, let's try to give them their third choice. So it was very well intentioned. But families quickly discovered that it wasn't safe to tell the city your true first choice, second choice, and third choice, because if you didn't get your first choice, there was an excellent chance that your second choice would already have filled all of its places with people who had listed it as their first choice. And so yeah. even, if you, even if you had very high priority at your second choice school, if you said it was your second choice, you wouldn't get in. So instead of, so it wasn't safe to tell the city where you wanted your child to go. Instead, you had to think, what's the best school I can get my child in if I claim that that school is my first choice? And as a result, families had this complicated strategic decision. And it looked to the city like many, many children were getting their first choice. But really, it was because parents were going through this, this calculation of what school can I get into? You know, which school is, are we near? Where does uh, uh, the older child go? Things like that. So, so, that, so that, you know, Tommy called that people have an incentive to lie about their preferences. And, and we think of that as, it wasn't, we didn't make it safe for people to tell us their preferences. But now in Boston and in New York and a number of other American cities, we've been able to, to propose school choice systems that do make it safe for uh, families to reveal their true preferences. 
And, they, and, and we do it basically using an algorithm for which Lloyd Shapley won the Nobel Prize when, when we shared the Nobel Prize in 2012. There's something called the deferred acceptance algorithm. And it has the, the wonderful property that if you don't get your first choice, the chance that you'll get your second choice is just the same as if you had listed it as your first choice. So once you fail to get your first choice, you're, you're not harmed at all regarding your second choice. It just looks to the algorithm as if it were your first choice. And, and so that makes it safe for families to state their true preferences. They don't have to avoid putting down their true first choice just because it's a risky choice that they might not get because it won't harm their chance of getting their second choice. How do you solve that algorithmically? I mean, how do you do that? Well, it's so, a, so it's be, 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 before Allah, be, be, before Allah answers that question, so let, let me jump back for thirty minutes. Okay. So you, one of your first questions was to ask Al to explain the concept of stability. Yeah. And this is exactly what these algorithms do. It selects a stable outcome. <laughs> so, so, so that's the you know where we started is now connected to where we are right now. And, and now you can answer Christer's question. Okay. If you remember it. We ask all the families for their rank order list. Where would you like your school to go? Your child to go? What school would you like? And we, uh, we then have in the computer, we have each child apply to its first choice school. And each school, if it gets more applications than it has spaces, it rejects the excess ones after ordering them in priority. So it, it it has to reject some students, it rejects the ones with the lowest priority at that school. But it doesn't accept the others yet, it just holds their, their applications and waits to see what new applications will come. And the new applications that come, come from people who were rejected at their first choice school. They now apply to their second choice school. And each school looks at all the applications that have come in so far, the ones that are being held from the last step of the algorithm and the new ones, and it orders them in terms of its priorities. So it doesn't care when they applied, it has a list of priorities. And if, if you have a very pro high priority at some school, then whenever you apply to that school, you'll go right to the top of its list. And after it reorders all its applications this way in terms of priorities, it rejects those that it doesn't have room for and they apply to their next choice. And this happens over and over until there are no more rejections. And what that means is the, it, it, it means that the outcome is going to be stable. And how can you see this? And, and now we go back to the question the way I tried to answer it earlier. Supposing I'm a student in this process and I get assigned to my third choice school. How do I know there are no blocking pairs? How do I know that my first choice school, which I would rather go to, wouldn't rather have me? Well, how did I get assigned to my third choice school? First, I applied to my first choice. And they rejected me when they filled all their places with higher priority students. Then I applied to my second choice and they rejected me when they got higher priority students to fill. So now I'm in my third choice, which is the best I can get because my first and second choice don't have room for me. So the outcome is stable there. I, I may want to go to my first or second choice, but they don't want me. The outcome is stable. And furthermore, it's a, what we call a dominant strategy uh, for families to put down their true preferences, to put down their rank order list, first choice, second choice, third choice, in, in correspondence to their actual preferences. Your, the the mm. school you put as your first choice should be your first choice. And those two results cross what used to be called non-cooperative and cooperative game theory. Right? So stability is an idea from cooperative game theory. It's about a property of the matching, that there are no blocking pairs. And dominant strategy is an idea from what used to be called non-cooperative game theory. But we're using mm. both these ideas together in the same market design, in the same game. And, and that's why I think the distinction between cooperative and non-cooperative game theory has outlived its usefulness. So, so I mean, maybe I can just make a very small and short remark here. So uh, I've been working with uh, school choice here in Sweden for many, many years, and we, and we do school choice now in multiple municipalities. And I've also tried to convince Swedish politicians that they should use this deferred acceptance algorithm. I think it's immensely important that, that they start doing that instead of the mechanism now that they use that can be manipulated. So. Uh, 
Uh, and I think we're almost there. It was actually suggested in, in a governmental report last year that we should start using the deferred acceptance algorithm just to, to prevent these strategic incentives to take place. So, so what happened? Can you tell us, for example, about New York, when you did this change in the assignment system, started to use the deferred acceptance algorithm, what happened to the number of, you know, what, what, what was the consequences in New York? It, it may be good for Swedish politicians to, to hear that. Okay. It's true. We had, we had good results in New York. So New York was different than a lot of American cities because the school principals had a lot of power. They had what, what game theorists would call big strategy sets. They could do a lot of things. And in particular, they were able to withhold some classes, some spaces, and, and keep them for later in the year. And the reason they wanted to do this was they, they had a system that was that didn't work so well at, at some point. And one of the ways it didn't work well was it left many children, 30,000 a year, unassigned until the last moment when they had to be administratively assigned to some school over which they hadn't expressed any preferences. It had to do with the, the slow way that they assigned uh, schools in New York before we, we were able to help. Uh, and so principals would conceal school places from the Department of Education of the city and uh, and then use these places to answer appeals that would come at the last minute uh, from, from students who hadn't been assigned. Uh, when, we, when we introduced a centralized procedure that, that produces stable matchings, one of the things we noticed in the first four years was the outcomes got better and better each year in terms of how many, pe how many students got their first choice or one of their first two choices or one of their first three choices. And this was a little puzzling because um, we, we hadn't changed the algorithm. The algorithm was the same, but it was performing better and better. And the reason it was performing better and better is these places that used to be withheld and concealed from the system were coming back into the system as, as principals discovered that this was the way to get the, the high priority students. So, uh, so it had the, the good effect of not just allocating students to available places more efficiently, but making more places available to the, to the centralized mechanism. Is that what you had in mind? Can I ask, can I ask you, maybe uh, I didn't understand this, but uh, how, how did you make the parents to the children feeling that they could safely present their preferences? Because yeah. they, they knew from experience that they couldn't. They did indeed. So, so we uh, talked to the press, we, we sent information home in, in what we sometimes call backpack mail. You know, so, so this in New York, we were, we were doing this for high school. So most of the students who were involved were already in the New York City schools. They were in middle school in eighth grade and they were going into high school, which is ninth grade. So in the course of eighth grade, when, when these preferences had to be submitted, um, you know, literature was sent home to the families explaining the process. And, uh -huh. uh, and, and there was an effort to, to, to educate the community. And, and you're quite right that this is a difficult effort. In Boston, we, we had some trouble doing that because in Boston, a lot of information was given in what were called family information centers. And the first year that we had the new system, we, we wrote a page of explanation saying how it was now safe to state your true preferences and saying that if you had any questions, here was a phone number uh, that you could call and, and someone would be happy to talk to you. And the man who was at the end of that phone was, was one of the administrators with whom we'd worked closely. And at, at the very first year we, we rolled out the new system, he said his phone was, was ringing quite a bit. And the, when he picked up the phone, there would be someone who said to him, I, I'm reading the document that you distributed. And um, if I understand it correctly, it seems to say that it's safe for me to put down my true preferences. And he'd say, that's exactly right. And the voice would go on and say, the reason I'm calling is I went to the family information center and the nice ladies there told me I had to be very careful what I put as my first choice. So the, the nice ladies at the family information center were still giving last year's advice. And oh my God, okay. <laughs> a while before everyone understood. Uh, so, yeah. so you're quite right, it's, it's a big issue. Um, we because of this, it's such a big issue that we, we changed our approach when we, when we started to talk to school boards. Uh, we, we initially had been saying to school boards, let us help you by designing a new matching algorithm that will have good properties. 
But by the time we got to the city of New Orleans, uh, we said to them, let us help you by designing a new match matching algorithm and communication protocol. So, so in New Orleans, we actually uh, participated in the first press conference that the, that the uh, New Orleans school district had. So we could explain to reporters what was going on and why it was safe to state your true preferences. Wow, fascinating. I, <clears throat> I'm also curious about your research on repugnant markets. Uh, can you explain that to us, to the listeners? What is that and what's your interest in it? Well, so I got interested in that by, by noticing that it's against the law almost everywhere for, to pay a donor for a kidney. Okay, so you can't, I can't, you could give me your kidney if you love me, but if you sold me your kidney, we would both be felons, both be criminals in the United States. Except, so, except in Iran. <laughs> except in Iran, where, where they have rules governing how that transaction works, uh, except okay. in Iran. So, so I started to become interested in why this was so and, and uh, what other markets have, have very different reception. So uh, before COVID, when I could still get on airplanes and go give seminars, I gave a seminar on this in Germany, and I'm, I'm guessing that the German laws are going to be similar to the Swedish laws, but I, I focused on prostitution, surrogacy, and kidney exchange. Now, surrogacy, yeah. uh, you, you can pay, in the United States, it's in California where I live, you can pay someone to bear a baby for you, and you and your wife, for example, would typically provide the, the, the sperm and the egg, but the the pregnancy would be carried out by the, the gestational surrogate, someone who would just make yeah. a baby. Uh, and that's legal in the United States, just about everywhere now, although it, it, it's legal in California longer than in New York, which just legalized it last year. Uh, but, but when I talked about these three things in Germany, uh, the laws were exactly the opposite. Only prostitution of those three is illegal in the United States. And that was the only one that was legal in Germany. And I suspect that surrogacy, I think surrogacy is illegal in Sweden. Uh, I don't think that you yes. recognize yeah. surrogacy. But it's, it's debated a lot in Sweden. And as it should be, because there are families that have trouble bearing a child. Uh, mm. and some of them will come to California and have a legal surrogate baby, but may have difficulty bringing it back to Sweden. Uh, you know, that was certainly the trouble in much of Western Europe. Uh, so in Sweden, where surrogacy, but so so thinking about this in the abstract, you might think, well, you know, we we have a law in Sweden against surrogacy because we don't like surrogacy. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that people who want to have a child often want to have have their own child, uh, not to adopt a child, and are prepared to go to great lengths to do this. So in Sweden, where surrogacy is illegal, womb transplantation was pioneered. Right? There are some women who uh, have had yeah, yeah. but not a womb, and they really want to have their own child, and sometimes they, they can get a transplanted womb from their mother or from uh, someone else. Uh, so, so that's just a sign. You know, so a repugnant transaction is a transaction that some people want to engage in, and other people think they shouldn't be allowed to. But the people who okay. want to engage in it may want to engage in it a lot. They may very much want to engage in it. So they're willing to go to great lengths, like having a womb transplant. So what that means, though, is no doubt there are also Swedish couples that go outside of Sweden to, to have a surrogate birth. And so Swedish laws, which, which may not recognize surrogacy, are nevertheless going to have to somehow come to terms with these children who should be Swedish children. You know, they're children of Swedish parents uh, who, who they want to bring back into Sweden. And in many countries in Europe where there are laws against surrogacy, the family courts allow the parents to adopt their own children, and that's how they become legally their children, even though they were uh -huh. born to a surrogate. So, so it turns out it's, you know, some markets get social support in some places and not in others, but you also have to think about bans on markets, making markets illegal, and what they accomplish and how they accomplish them. It's going to be very hard to completely ban surrogacy in, in Sweden. Uh, because you can have a surrogate birth in California. Uh, so, so families that have the means can have surrogates and then you'll, you'll you know, have to deal with that. So, so as an economist, I'm interested in studying how these laws change. So right now in the United States, 
in some states, marijuana is legal, and in some states, it's illegal. And I just, I have a blog on market design, and I just blogged about a, a rural town in Oregon, a state where marijuana is legal, that's right on the border with Idaho, a state where marijuana is illegal. So of course, lots of people from Idaho come into Oregon and buy uh, marijuana. And I'm guessing that it will become less and less possible for Idaho to enforce strict bans on marijuana because the people who are coming back into Idaho with marijuana from, from 10 miles away, from just across the border, are not don't look like criminals. They look like people who smoke cigarettes or drink wine. They're, they're people who bought legal marijuana in Oregon. So, uh, so I, I imagine that 10 years from now, if we talk again, marijuana will be legal everywhere in the United States. And in yeah. the same way, I imagine that, that Sweden will come to terms with, with how to help people uh, who need assistance in having children. Uh, but can I ask you, uh, I mean, uh, is, it, is there any game theoretical differences between, between repugnant markets and, and ordinary markets? Or, or is your interest only in the sort of ethical and legal aspects of this? Oh, no, no. So, so it's, it's not, not the difference between, there is a game theoretic difference, but it's not between repugnant markets and ordinary markets. It's between repugnant markets and ordinary crimes. Right, so so uh, <laughs> okay, surrogacy is made a crime in much part in many parts of Europe, but it's a but it's a repugnant market. There are there are people who want to engage in it, so they are blocking pairs. It's like it's they're, they're not stable. The ban is not stable because there are people who want to employ a surrogate, and there are people who would be happy to bear a baby for someone else and and be paid yeah. for it. Uh, it. Incidentally, being a surrogate mother is a very good job for someone with small children. Right, you can do it at home. You're you're being pregnant, uh, yeah. So, so uh, you know, so so you can ask yourself about many repugnant markets. You know, why is it why is it easier to buy not just marijuana in the United States? Why is it easy? Why is it easier to buy heroin in the United States than it is to hire a hitman, a murderer? Right. You know, if I wanted to hire a murderer, I'd have a lot of trouble, and I'd probably get arrested in the process. But I bet there's a place not far from where I am, and I bet there's a place not far from where you are where heroin is sold, okay? And I'm guessing heroin is just as illegal in Sweden as it is in yeah. the US. But maybe yeah. not, because in the US, you know, uh, we had, in 2019, you know, uh, we had more than 60,000 opioid overdose deaths. So heroin is very illegal in the US. Our prisons are full of people with drug convictions. but we have lots of overdose deaths, and heroin is easily available cheaply. We can't even suppress the supply enough to make it too expensive for poor people to buy. So, mm. so we're really failing in our war against drugs. Whereas in many places, and maybe Sweden is one of them, you, you, in many places, drug addicts are treated more as patients than as criminals. Whereas in the US, we're still treating them as criminals, and it's not working. And the reason is there are people who want to buy drugs and people who want to sell them. Whereas we have vastly fewer murders than we have drug overdose deaths because no one wants to be murdered, right? It's not a repugnant transaction. It's just a crime. It, but is it your personal opinion that these kinds of things should be legalized? Mariana, uh, prostitution, um, uh, what you call it, surrogacy, for, for example? Yeah. Well, I think that, so, so I don't have a, so I don't, pretend you know, as an economist to be able to tell you what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. But as an economist, I think that we should pay attention to what happens when we say something should not be allowed. And that's why okay. I spoke about heroin. I don't like heroin. I think no one should use it. It doesn't seem like it's good for anyone in any circumstance. But we have a lot of heroin in the United States and people are mm. dying from, from overdoses of heroin. And part of the reason is they're getting their heroin from criminals instead of from pharmacists. So, so they get mixtures that are hard to, to titrate, to, to figure out what the right dose is, things like that. Um, and and if, if, for instance, uh, heroin addiction were a disease that we recognized as a disease, then you could be prescribed heroin that would be uh, produced by a pharmacist, then you would know exactly how much you, you could safely take. Uh, that would cut down deaths a lot. Uh, we already do things like have clean needle exchanges. It used to be that that people who uh, who used injectable 
illegal drugs, uh, also got AIDS and hepatitis. Yeah, that, that was a big debate in Sweden quite a few years yeah. ago, but now I think it's used. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. No, I think we've we've pretty much addressed that too. And and but it was a it, you know people thought you shouldn't act like you like taking heroin is normal. You shouldn't help these people get clean needles. But it turns out when you help them get clean needles, you cut down on deaths. Uh, mm. Good. Uh, so, so my role as an economist is not to say heroin should be legal or illegal. It's to say maybe we're not dealing with heroin in a way that gets us the results we want. In which case, mm. we might think of redesigning the market because when we when we write the criminal law the way we have, we we help design the black market for heroin that we have. And maybe we would like a different black market, or maybe it shouldn't be completely black. You know, maybe there should be legal ways to get heroin. There are legal ways to get substitutes, you know, methadone and, and things like that. Uh, but there's still lots of heroin and lots of opioid overdose deaths. And similarly for uh, surrogacy. Uh, you know, in Canada, there's not a ban on surrogacy. It's, in Canada, surrogacy is more like kidney donation. It's, surrogacy is legal in Canada, but you are not allowed to pay the surrogate. So just as kidney donation is legal, but you're not allowed to pay the kidney donor. So, so surrogacy is legal. Surrogate parents are recognized as the parents, but there aren't a lot of surrogates in Canada because you can't pay the surrogate. So Canadian families that, that need surrogates come to the United States. Where, where you can pay the surrogates, so there are, there are available surrogates. So, so I think the Canadians have to ask themselves what they are accomplishing with this particular law and whether it's doing what they want. Another example is paying for blood plasma. The United States is one of the countries where you can pay for, you can pay a donor for plasma to come to a, a blood center and you, you give blood out of one arm and you get back the red blood cells in the other arm. Uh, after I, I had COVID and I gave what's called convalescent plasma. You know, I gave plasma to uh, try to help cure people. That, that apparently doesn't work very well. Uh, but, but the United States exports more than $20 billion a year of plasma pharmaceutical products. And Canada, where it's in, in most provinces not legal to pay for plasma, they import from the United States. And most countries where, where it's not legal to pay for plasma have to import plasma products and plasma products pr produce a lot of life-saving uh, drugs. So, uh, so that's a case where for whatever reason, Canada is reluctant to have Canadians paid for their plasma, but, but is prepared to import plasma from Americans who were paid. Uh, so, and it turns out, I mean, there've been some studies of this, it turns out it's more expensive to, to get voluntary donation plasma than to purchase it because if you are getting voluntary donors, you have to do all sorts of marketing and outreach efforts. You have to, you know, in the United States, we don't pay whole blood donors, right? So when I give blood, it's in response to some announcement that somewhere on campus, they're collecting blood. Uh, but it turns out doing those collections is, is costly. It's even though you get the blood for free from the donors, it's not that, it's not that you always have enough blood or, uh, as much as you need or, or that or that it's cheap to get. And so the studies of plasma is that it's it's actually cheaper to have a regular source of supply at, at, at blood centers that pay for plasma than it is to, uh, to periodically try to get enough plasma. So Australia is where those studies have been done. And they and like Canada, they have some donated plasma and then they purchase the rest. So so as an economist, you know, I wouldn't want to say that it's not uh, aesthetically nicer to get all your plasma from, from donors who aren't paid. But if it proves to be difficult, then the question is, what do you do? What do you do for, for all the people who have immune deficiencies or, or hemophilia or, you know, there's a whole long list of diseases where the, the treatments come from plasma. Uh, in those cases, I think you should uh, pay donors. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't apparently harm donors and, and the plasma is safe. I mean, there've been a lot of studies of this. So, so there's a case where I think I have an opinion, you know, just from lots of experience around the world in unpaid and paid plasma that, that it makes sense to pay plasma donors. But interesting. Oh, no, no. Um, all right. I, I'd like to ask you, we, we, we should end soon, but I must ask you a little bit about the development in your home country. What do you think about the 
political situation now and everything that happened during the Trump era. <laughs> What's I'm, your view? I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that you've heard about that. Um, <laughs> no, so that's right. We are we are a deeply divided country in many ways right now. Yeah, uh, you know, and it's uh, and the deep division didn't go away with the change in administration, right? So so President Trump is no longer president. He lost an election, although even that is is subject to dispute in some quarters. Uh, I think that uh, we're ready to to resume our the United States is ready to resume our relations with the rest of the world much uh, mm -hmm. where they left off. Of course, they've been they've been damaged. You know, we're, we're a less trustworthy place than we used to be because we undergo uh, political upheavals from time to time and might have some in our future. I mean, that's the, the danger. So I'm hopeful that that we'll get back to sort of competent, responsible government and um, and that that will ease some of the divisions, you know, the the but but many of the divisions are make themselves felt in things that look like repugnant transactions. So, so we've had a lot of discussion, as you have in Sweden, about whether wearing masks during COVID is a, a, a good, you know, public yeah. responsibility or not. And, uh, you know, what should be open and closed and how we should think about uh, our responsibilities as citizens to, to uh, influence the transmission of disease. Uh, and of course, Sweden has taken a, a, a different path than many other European countries in, in thinking about that. So, so I think that's a good example of, of how markets and, and market kind of processes and, and economies in general need public support, right? The public support, the, the solution reached in Sweden was very different from that reached in yeah. many other countries. Uh, and that has to do with public support, with communication, with with gathering support for uh, for things that might be difficult and necessary, and and but are controversial. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're difficult, but not necessary. I mean, th those were the the terms in which I imagine uh, much of the debate about uh, should restaurants close down, should bars close down, should people wear masks, must have been conducted in Sweden as they were in the U.S. and and. Strangely, in the U.S., opinions on things like wearing masks were correlated with political opinions on other things. Mm. You know, so so in what we call red states, which meant uh, Republican, Trump-supporting states, there was much less mask wearing. Uh, not at all clear how how that interacted with the progress of of COVID of of the pandemic, uh, because. It eventually hit all all of our states quite hard, um, but but the kinds of discussions that that we have about that are very much similar to the kinds of discussions we have about repugnant transactions, about mm -hmm. prostitution, about um, about surrogacy, about kidney exchange. But what do you think, uh, as a scientist, about the the fast spreading of very very weird conspiracy theories that are sometimes so extremely crazy, but people obviously seem to believe in them. What, 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 what is that? Why is that happening? Well, so, so one thing that's become polarized along with our politics uh, is our media consumption, right? When, mm. when I was a child, uh, there were uh, a few network television shows that, that uh, transmitted the news into, into many households. And there were a couple of big newspapers that, that had national uh, coverage. And so a lot of people uh, understood events in the world in similar ways. They might not agree about them, but they, they, they work from a common set of facts. But if you yeah. get most of your news from your Facebook feed or from your Twitter feed, then you might live in an entirely different world than I live in, uh, yeah. and have a different set of facts to deal with. So I think that that's one of the things that's going on. I think there were always conspiracy theories, uh, but, but they're but I think we have a lot to learn still about their transmission and, and spread and who believes them, who creates them and who spreads them. Uh, Do you think your, your work on stable markets could be applied? Game theoretical ideas could be applied on this problem in any way? Well, I think game theoretic ideas could be applied. I don't know that it will be work on stable markets, uh, on stable matching. Uh, but when you think about the organization of uh, big internet service providers like 
uh, Google and Facebook and Twitter, uh, you can certainly think about the, the rules by which, for instance, they recommend things. So Google owns uh, YouTube, which is mm. a big repository of videos. And one of the things you find on, on YouTube is after you've looked at a video, they recommend another video. And, and that recommender engine can be played with. Maybe it's not doing what it should. And similarly in Facebook, you, you, you know, your, your feeds are, are partly curated by Facebook. And so those are how those, <clears throat> how those work. Those are market design decisions. Yeah, okay, I see. Well, right. I think we we should end here. It was it was really really interesting to talk to you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for for participating in this podcast. Thank you so much. Well, thank you and thank you, Tommy. You know, Tommy yeah. wrote a foreword for my book, so so I got to <laughs> read it in Google Translate. So uh, so thank you for that. <laughs>